on today's edition of Cronkite Sports Live, Sun Devil Swim and Dive are national champions for the first time, but the coach, he's not sticking around to celebrate. ASU baseball has won five in a row and is about to head to Corvallis to clash with the number five team in the nation. We'll break down who the unexpected heroes are from Willie Bloomquist, guys. The final four is in town and there are indeed some implications for ASU. Our reporters are on site with the latest. All this and so much more coming up on Cronkite Sports Live. of the sun and we're going to be here to break it all down for you welcome to another edition of Cronkite Sports Live Max Cepeda alongside Ben Paris and Ben I gotta admit we've been here nearly two years but it seems like every year there's always some big epic center event that takes place in this city I got no complaints the final four this weekend we get the world baseball classic the Super Bowl last year but this week some national championships are in Tempe's as well absolutely because for the first time in seven long years there is a national championship coming to Tempe as men swim and dive was able to finally secure its first program national championship you can see right there the team score of five two three point five nearly 90 points more than every other program at the national championships seven individual titles three ncaa records set and nine school records were set for more on how the national championships turned out for the sun devils we'll send it over to ben and our swimming insider casey mcnulty we're proud to welcome in our wcsn swimming insider casey mcnulty who was in indianapolis tracking the national championships Casey, you were there, you saw it with your own two eyes. How did the Sun Devils pull away for their first ever national championship? Yeah, so day one was a bit of a rough start for the Devils. They came into the meet as the top seed in both relays that day, and they snagged second place. Now that was a bit of an underwhelming performance. So they took that momentum from day one and they turned it into energy for day two. So we saw Land Marchand break that NCAA record in the 500 yard freestyle, and we saw multiple other Devils in those final events which racked up some big points for the team to take the lead. Moving on to day three, we saw the Devils break that 400 medley relay NCAA record. It was also the first national title in history for ASU in a relay event. Keeping that momentum from day three on to day four, Zalan Sarkani started out the night with a national title in the 1650 yard freestyle. He was the first Sun Devil to do so in that event, and Land Marchand carried that momentum in the 200-yard breaststroke to claim a national title. So did Karun in the 200 fly, and then the 400 medley relay again. Sorry, I messed up. No, nope. no, nope, it was a 400 free. It's okay. It's okay. Damn. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. Ugh. You're good. My bad. WCSN Swimming Insider Casey McNulty, who was in Indianapolis for us covering the NCAA Men's Swimming and Diving Championship. Casey, you saw it there with your own two eyes. How did the Sun Devils pull away for their first ever national championship? Yeah, so day one was a bit of a rough start for the Devils. They came into the meet as the top seed in both relays and managed to take second place. Now that was a bit of an underwhelming performance, so the Devils wanted to turn it around on day two, and Leon Marchand did just that with his NCAA record in the 500-yard freestyle. Moving on to day three, the Devils set the NCAA record in the 400 medley relay. It was the first time ASU had ever won a relay title, and they carried that momentum onto day four, again setting another national, uh, national record title in the 400 freestyle relay. Now, 
Zal Sarkani started out that night with a national title in the 1650-yard freestyle, and Leon Marchand carried that momentum into the 200 breaststroke, and freshman Ilya Karun again carried that momentum into his 200-yard butterfly race to top off the night and give the Devils that national title win. It seems like they always do it with dominance, and they always find a way to set a new record along the way. The last time we had you on the show, we talked about some of the individual standouts at the Pac-12 championships. Who was it this time at Nationals? Yeah, so freshman Ilya Kroon really had a breakout performance in that 200-yard butterfly. He didn't have the best meet leading up to that event, but he really turned things around, and he managed to get his hand on the wall first right there. And then Zalan Sarkhani in the 1650-yard freestyle, again, the first Sun Devil ever to win a national title in that event. Moving on to sophomore duo Hubert Coase and Owen McDonald absolutely dominated in those backstroke and IM events, scoring some huge points for the Sun Devils. And then sophomore Johnny Kulo, the anchor leg for both of those NCAA record-setting relays. He had a ton of pressure, but he managed to pull through for the Devils and earned them not only a national title, but two NCAA records. It's the first time the university has won a national championship since women's golf did it in 2017. The first one for the program, of course. So how significant is that? Yeah, so this is a monumental feat for the Devils. Just thinking back to 2008 when the program was cut, to the hiring of Bowman in 2015, just that timeline, and now winning the national championship I don't think anyone at ASU would have thought that this was possible years ago. And now we know ASU is under new management for Swim and Dive with head coach Herbie Bem. So this is definitely a new era heading into the future without Bowman. And Bem can really shape the team into what he thinks it can be in the future. You mentioned the new head coach, and that's because Bob Bowman announced on Monday as the new director of swimming and diving at Texas, a position that was created just for him. And it seems like not all the Sun Devil swimmers knew that he would be leaving the program. Zalan Zarkani telling Hungarian media this week that, hey, we didn't know this was going to happen. At home, more people can think that they are in the picture and therefore also see the future. I am surprised because we, the members of the Arizona State team, they were also surprised by the announcement of Bob Bowman, whose eyes were clouded and maybe teary when he stood before us. Of course, you can guess, but the situation is still so unclear that we can't see far ahead either. Also reporting this morning is that Hubert Koss is hitting the transfer portal. That's someone with Leon Marchand telling Hungarian media, both of them plan on trading with Bob Bowman for the Olympics. Just how significant and what does it mean if he's hitting the transfer portal? Right, so just because Bob is at Texas does not mean that Coase is going to be going to Texas. This is a necessary move for him to be in the transfer portal in order to communicate with Bowman leading up to the Olympics. As you said, Bowman is going to be an instrumental part into the training of both Coase and Marshan. So this is what he needs to do in order for that preparation. It is too early to tell what Coase is going to decide whether or not he will stay at ASU or if he'll make the move to Texas, but only time will tell. So the Bob Bowman era is over in Tempe, but he did what he said he would, won a national championship. And to tell us about his legacy, we sent it over to Justin Carter. Bob Bowman is a national champion with ASU, but now he's gone, headed to Texas as the director of Swim and Dive. And while he may be on the way out, let's take a look at how he helped pave the way for what swimming at Arizona State would become. In the latter half of 2015, Bowman was hired by ASU thanks to, at the time, ASU's newest athletic director, Ray Anderson. When Bowman was hired, the Sun Devils had just placed fifth at Pac-12. ASU hadn't placed top three at Pac-12 since a second place finish in 1995 and had been in turmoil since the late 2000s when the program nearly went extinct, barely saved by an assortment of alumni at the time. These are three highest ranked ADs there, which never happens. And then they say, oh, we got bad news, we're dropping swimming. Bowman's early years went about as expected, with little success but a promising future. Notably, in 2017, swimming phenom Grant House was recruited, demonstrating players' willingness to swim for Bowman despite a lack of program success. Jump forward to the summer of 2020, when the French national record holder in the 400 IM announces his verbal commitment to ASU, saying, I chose Arizona State because I had a very good contact with Bowman, I trust him a lot, he's had an incredible career, and I think he's one of the best coaches in the world. That Frenchman was 18-year-old Leon Marchand, now set to be one of the faces of the Paris Olympics this summer. 
With Marshawn and other top recruits committing to Arizona State, ASU was slated for an elite 2022-2023 season, and they certainly lived up to the hype, taking first place in Pac-12s. However, they fell just short of NCAAs at second place behind the national champion Golden Bears. Marshawn opted to return to ASU, and Bowman recruited a few more key pieces, including Pac-12 Freshman of the Year, Ilya Karun. Bowman's squad was unstoppable all season and finally reached the promised land, a Pac-12 and NCAA championship. Now Bowman's right-hand man, Herbie Bem, who was one of the guys who helped save the program before Bowman's arrival, will take his place. Bowman may be gone now, but he's left the program in an infinitely better place than when he found it, with ASU at the top. For Cronkite Sports, I'm Justin Carter. From the pool to the diamond we go as the Crosstown rivalry reignites out on Tuesday night between Arizona State and GCU. We kick it off at the top of the second inning. A one-out double from Ben Anarchy that was able to get through, was able to be able to lead to their first run of the ballgame thanks to Ben Crenshaw. As GCU would take the early 1-0 lead. He's keeping it in the second. A sacrifice fly from Tyler Wilson sent to deep center field. Kian Vu able to make the catch, but it was with the bases loaded, so an easy run producing. Now 2-0 Lopes. On to the bottom of the third we go. It is a 2-1 game. Kian Vu right through the 4-3 hole. And he gives the Devils the lead with an RBI knock. It is now 3-2. He brings home two runners in. As it still remains 3-2 in the bottom of the third. And now an opportunity for uh, in, with runners in scoring position. Josiah Cromwick able to put one down the left field line and extend the lead. It is now 5-2. You can see Vu bumped, bouncing down those bases as he's able to come home. Bottom of the fourth, ASU now up 5-2, to two, and Nick McClain once again into left, able to get one past the shortstop and gets the RBI, scoring Steven Andina. It is now 6-2, Sun Devils. However, in the top of the seventh, GCU able to get a couple of runs back. Ben Crenshaw stepping up to the plate, hammering one to center field. Grand slam. It is now 8-4, GCU lead, and as Joe Davis would say, this game was turned upside down. But was only the beginning because we head to the bottom of the ninth. Harris Williams with the bases loaded and only one out. Sends one to deep left center field and it falls just beyond the hands of Eddie Pelk. Two runs will score and the Sun Devils win arguably the craziest game of the year. 9-8 is your final. Sun Devils back above 500. Here's Willie Bloomquist after the insane game. I think the mindset is now we're expected to get things done. right? And, and to me that's some of that's accountability, some of that is just, okay guys, the expectations are, we're gonna figure out a way to win. We're gonna figure out a way to, to I'm not gonna, we're gonna figure out a way to get done, things done in the right situations here, so. The longest winning streak of the season for ASU has been fueled by players stepping up from the bench and stepping up to the occasion in the big moments. To tell us who's been heating up in the dugout, here's WCSM baseball reporter, Gabby Chernoff. ASU's bench has been hot, propelling the Devils to a five-game win streak to get their record back above 500. Head coach Willie Bloomquist's utilization of three players have been a catalyst for the Sun Devils' recent successes. Kian Vu, Eamon Lance, and Mario Demera are burning off the bench. Vu made an incredible diving catch to secure ASU's first series sweep of the season against Cal last weekend and has been dominating at the plate. ASU has won in six of his last seven starts, and in those six, he recorded at least one run and a hit. That, along with his 429 batting average, has earned him high praise from Coach Bloomquist, who says that he'll be getting a lot more playing time. Eamon Lance is a graduate transfer from Santa Clara, who was regularly in the starting lineup for the Broncos. He started just three games for ASU, nailing home runs in each of his first two starts, all of which have come in the past week, and all were ASU wins. Lance has expressed that it's been frustrating not playing, but that that's fueled him even more. Bloomquist says he respects that competitive energy, so don't be surprised to see number seven in the starting lineup more consistently. Mario Demera, another transfer out of San Francisco, went 5 for 12 last weekend against Cal, had a grand slam in game two, and ended the weekend with his first six RBI. With those big numbers in just three starts, Bloomquist will likely keep him in the starting lineup to fuel ASU's offensive flame. With the potential of those three players fully unlocked, the Devils will look to keep the win streak alive 
this weekend at number five, Oregon State. For Cronkite Sports, I'm Gabby Chernoff. It's a big week for Sun Devil baseball and softball as they each get ready for Pac-12 series against top five opponents. To break it down, we start with Parker Porrell in baseball's matchup against the number five Beavers from Oregon State. ASU may have a five game winning streak, but it will be a battle in order to take down the fifth ranked Oregon State Beavers. The Beavers enter the series second in the Pac-12 with the key series win against Utah and a sweep over Washington but the Beavs have had its share of shortcomings, losing back-to-back -back games to USC. But don't let these losses fool you. The Beavs' bats are ranked first in conference in hits, home runs, batting average, and on-base percentage, with the Beavs star player Travis Bazana batting an average of 465 with 47 hits and 16 homers. Willie Bloomquist's squad has momentum, but it'll be a tall test in order to take down Oregon State starting at 5.30 p.m. tonight. But ASU softball also has a top matchup tonight as well, and Crawford McKinstry has the breakdown on the second-ranked Stanford Cardinal. As Pac-12 play intensifies, the Sun Devils have another tough series ahead against number two Stanford beginning tonight at 7. The Cardinal boasts an 8-1 conference record, which is the best in the pack. Additionally, Stanford has defeated nine top 25 opponents this season. The Cardinal are led by one of the best pitchers in the nation in Nigeri Kanu. The sophomore has an astounding 052 ERA and 172 strikeouts this year, both of which lead the country. Stanford is focused on defense and rarely let opponents gain momentum at the plate as the Cardinal have prevented opponents from scoring entirely in 13 of their 28 wins this season. Stanford's deep roster has seen many different pieces step up in each of their wins this year, and the Sun Devils will have their hands full against them this weekend. Back to you guys at the desk. Thanks so much, Parker and Crawford. And staying at Club Farrington, ASU softball's offense has been through a whirlwind, to say the least, since their final season of Pac-12 play began last month. To break down the state of the Sun Devil lineup, as you can see with all of those numbers right there, before their matchup in Palo Alto with number two Stanford, here's WCN, WCSN softball reporter Jacob Brock. ASC softball is 2-7 and seven so far in Pac-12 play, and that record has a lot to do with lineup inconsistencies. The Sun Devils haven't had the same batting order in back-to-back -back games once during the entirety of conference play, and whether you attribute it to injuries or coaching, the lack of continuity has clearly played a major role in the lack of team success. So what's been working? Well, for starters, both of the Sun Devils' two wins throughout Pac-12 play featured Audrey LeClaire leading off with Kelsey Hall batting second. In fact, ASU averaged 4.8 runs per game on a .246 team batting average in conference games featuring that leadoff duo and only 1.5 runs per game on a .186 team batting average in Pac-12 games with a different leadoff duo. Kelsey Hall was pushed back to sixth in the order when ASU got swept by Oregon, so according to the numbers, might be a good idea to bring her back into that number two slot. An adjustment that hasn't worked so well for the Sun Devils has been moving Alicia Demby down in the batting order. It's a confusing move to say the least, as Demby currently leads ASU in home runs with seven, while no other Sun Devil teammate has more than four. In the 20 straight games before Pac-12 play that featured Demby batting within the top four of ASU's order, ASU averaged 6.9 runs per game with a .336 team batting average. The team's numbers have suffered since Denby dropped in the order, as ASU is only averaging 3.38 runs per game on a .244 team batting average. The pack is an unforgiving softball conference, so these small lineup changes can be the difference between wins and losses. Maroon and Gold fans have to hope that Megan Bartlett has been crutching the numbers, as ASU has a tough series against number two Stanford that kicks off tonight at 7 p.m. Guys? A 17-3 victory for Sun Devil Lacrosse against Detroit Mercy on Tuesday. How about the offense and defense feeling dominant against a team that is amongst the bottom 10 in the nation with a 3-9 overall record? The outcome hasn't been the same, however, when they face off against ranked opponents. They're 0-5 in that category on the season. Aiden O'Neill tells us why. Arizona State Lacrosse has had a mixture of brilliance and lackluster performances throughout the 2024 campaign, taking care of business when needed while also losing games by wide margins to strong opponents. 
Coach Van Thoff and the squad have had a season characterized by the polar opposites, in particular the inability to stop high-powered offenses. Ranking bottom 50 in the country in defensive efficiency, Arizona State has been unable to keep the ball out of the net. Michigan starts their offensive play with a cutter across the lane, as no one puts a body on the defenseless player. This results in the help side of the defense being vacant, allowing for a one-on-one -on -one opportunity where the Wolverines put it in the top right corner. A last second strong side attempt to slash the ball out is unsuccessful, and no Sun Devil is in between the goalie and shot maker. Another ranked opponent got the best of Arizona State with a simple move over the middle of the field. Trojan attacker Isabel Vitale begins this play with a hesitation dodge, evading the defense and creating enough space to deliver a strong pass inside. Midfielder Keeley Cleland drops down on defense for a potential double team, but the timing is off on the collapse and another goal finds the back of the net. The flashes of excellence have been shown, but in order for Arizona State to enter the elite conversation of lacrosse, they will need to hone in on seizing offensive firepower. After coming in second in the first session of the Pac-12 Championships last week in Utah, ASU Gymnastics kicks off their run at a national title today at the NCAA Regionals in Berkeley. However, even with possessing the number 22 ranking in the country by the College Gymnast Association, the Sun Devils entered this year's tournament as underdogs. For more on the history behind their tournament berth and the competition behind them and ahead, here's WCSN Gymnastics Insider, Marina Williams. Just a bit ago, ASU advanced through their first round of regionals in Berkeley, placing second with a score of 197-15 behind number 6 Denver and upsetting number 11 UCLA. The Sun Devils, Huskies, and Bruins weren't the only Pac-12 schools competing in regionals as this is the third consecutive season that all eight Pac-12 programs have qualified. By moving on to regional finals, ASU will face the top two teams from the second session in Berkeley. Competing for those spots tonight will be the host number three seed California, 14 seed Auburn, Stanford, and Southern Utah. Arizona was knocked out early during the first session in Fayetteville, falling to the host Arkansas, Kentucky, and Nebraska. Oregon State fell to number two LSU, number 15 Minnesota, and BYU in the second session. The first session in Gainesville saw a victory by number five Utah over number 12 Michigan State, Towson, and Maryland to advance to the next round. With two Pac-12 teams already going to the regional finals and three competing tonight, there is a serious chance to see several into the national championships in Fort Worth. Despite loads of top competition in Berkeley, ASU is still fighting to be one of the teams to represent the Conference of Champions in its last go-around, despite being the unseeded underdogs. Sun Devil Women's Golf has wrapped up its regular season and are peaking at the right time with the Pac-12 Championships and NCAA Regionals still to come. Prior to the postseason, Arizona State finished with two team victories at the Darius Rucker Intercollegiate on Hilton Head Island in South Carolina and the Dr. Donis Thompson Invitational in Hawaii, where the team set a new 54-hole scoring record with its 42 under par total. They wrapped things up on Saturday at their home event, the Ping ASU Invitational, climbing up the leaderboard six positions to claim a... Head coach Missy Parquet is pleased where her team is after failing to qualify for the NCAA Championships last year. Heading in, to be in such a good good situation to feel good, we've got to take a little break and then and then back at it, get ready for start to uh, get ready for uh, Pac-12 Conference Championship. And we're just taking one one day at a time, one tournament at a time, one day at a time. We're not getting ahead of ourselves. We still have a lot of season to go. Um, so, and we're going to celebrate when uh, we're going to celebrate what, when we have great days like today. Leading the way for the Sun Devils is the team's lone senior, an Arizona native, Ashley Many, who claimed her first outright collegiate victory at the Dr. Donis Thompson Invitational in March. With more, Sam. Well, Ben. If there's anything that ASU does best, it's produced some of the world's most talented amateur golfers in the world. In her senior year, Ashley Many is currently making her third consecutive appearance in the Augusta National Women's Amateur, where she unfortunately missed the cut for the second year in a row, but still got to participate in a practice round today at the infamous Augusta National Golf Club, where the Masters will be played next week. 
Many has talked so much about growth this season, but it's more about cementing her Sun Devil legacy. Many could possibly become the only four-time All-American in program history, and her win at the Dr. Donis Invitational gifted many with the lowest 54-hole total in program history, breaking a 35-year-old record by two strokes at 14 under. Now, in her final season, many has her eyes set on one thing when she returns from her trip down memory lane, and winning the Pac-12 and national title for ASU is just that. All about tying a bow on that illustrious ASU career. He said the Masters next week. The alum, John Rahm, trying to defend the green jacket. Time for a quick check-in at Mullet Arena, as Sun Devil Hockey currently holds numerous names inside the transfer portal, which opened this past Sunday and includes a handful of key contributors from the winningest regular season in program history, with those like Ryan O'Reilly and longtime netminder TJ Semptonfelter officially confirming their new destinations in Providence and North Dakota, respectively. The Final Four is here in Phoenix. That's where the road ends. And while ASU was nowhere close to competing for the national championship, there still are some implications for them. Blake Neiman and Aiden Blank are at State Farm Stadium with more. Fellas, welcome to the Final Four. The Devils may not be dancing in their own backyard, but Bobby Hurley still has plenty of connections to the teams trying to capture their one shining moment. DJ Horn, who was a member of ASU's NCAA tournament team a year ago, has been lighting it up for his hometown NC State Wolfpack. The Raleigh native leads the pack with 16.8 points per game and looks to power past Purdue into the national championship, where he could face one of Bobby Hurley's other companions. Alabama has been led to its first Final Four in school history by Nate Oates, who got his start in college basketball as an assistant on Bobby Hurley's staff at Buffalo. He said if it wasn't for Bobby, along with his brother Dan, who will be facing Saturday night, that he wouldn't be here. The younger Hurley has a chance to help UConn accomplish the rare feat of winning back-to-back -back national titles in his brother's backyard. Bobby said he is rolling out the red carpet for his brother this week with his facilities at ASU. And Dan said if Bobby can have some of the resources that him and along with the other Final Four teams have, that he could have a chance of getting back to the place he became so accustomed to as a player. But he's going to need some help navigating this new era of college athletics, and that starts with a new athletic director. And our Aiden Blank has more on a potential candidate that has ties to the Valley. Blake, the road ends here, but for UConn Athletic Director Dave Benedict, it's the place where it all began. Benedict is a Tempe native. He worked at Arizona State as an associate AD for over 10 years, and his wife is a four-time All-American and two-time national champion with Sun Devil Gymnastics. Many might remember Arizona State is in the market for a new athletic director. A lot of folks think that Benedict might be the perfect person. After his exit from Tempe, he went to Auburn and Minnesota, working with millions of dollars to revitalize athletic facilities. Well, sounds a lot like DFA could use some help. Benedict would be the perfect guy. And of course, in 2020, he moved UConn from the American to the Big East. It was a big move, much like Arizona State's about to do, going from the Pac-12 to the Big 12. It's only a matter of time before Arizona State finds their guy. Dave Benedict is in the Valley this week and might be the perfect candidate. From the Final Four, Aiden Blank, Cronkite Sports. Now, Bobby Hurley won back-to-back -back national championships as a player at Duke. His brother, Danny, trying to do the same as a coach at UConn. You could see why he, he loves it here. You could see why uh, he values his job here. And, and uh, you know, I think when he's in a position um, you know, to have all, all the resources that a lot of us at this Final Four have, when he has that at his full disposal, you know, he'll be up on this dais, and someday I'll be, uh, I'll be, I'll be supporting him. National champions, two words that in the Valley that are few and far between. Just 16 years ago, the swim and dive program was cut by the athletic department and it took donations, ironically from some from the school down south, to get the program back up and running in Tempe. The tale of the tape from ASU Swim's progression from a barely fundable sport to a perennial powerhouse is a simple one. Build a program from the top down. Six years after the program was left for dead and resurrected, they hired a man named Bob Bowman. But let's get this straight first. Bob Bowman could have done this anywhere. Did the warm desert air and the facilities help move the needle? Sure, but don't get it twisted. Bowman isn't just one of the best minds in collegiate swimming. 
He's one of the best minds in swimming, period. And for all his faults, hiring Bob Bowman may have been the best hire Ray Anderson made during his entire tenure in Tempe. Now 70 All-American honors, 37 individual conference titles, and two team conference championships, and one team national title later, Bowman's gone. The face of a program left for greener pastures. Can you really blame him? Texas ranks number two on the list of most profitable universities in this country. So do with that information what you may. But like I mentioned earlier, there is a lesson to learn here. You have to build a program or a department from top to bottom. And almost every university in America, football is that top dog. So what happens if you don't allocate the resources to sustain success on the gridiron? Well, some would say you lose the face of your swim program. And now with Kenny Dillingham back in the Valley, ASU football has their guy. But he's going to need the funds to bring that success that the fans at Mountain America Stadium desperately yearn for. The days of universities building pillars of social morality are over. What matters now are the stacks of green that line the pockets of the powers that be. And a microcosm of that, the days of simply recruiting and winning are over. The name of the game now is to recruit and retain. And in the case of Bob Bowman, ASU fell short again. And that's the way it is. Time for top plays. Last Friday night, top the third inning. Rodney Green Jr. crushes one to right, but Nick McLean makes the play at the wall, robbing a home run. ASU goes on to win 10 to nine and sweep the series. Number two, we go back to that illustrious night on Tuesday. Bottom of the ninth, Harris Williams to left center field, just over the glove of Eddie Pelk, walking it off against the Lopes. Brandon Compton and Kean Vu coming home to score. Sun Devils win it 9-8 and are back above 500. And why not one more time? The first national championship for Arizona State in seven years. The Devils celebrating their win in Indianapolis. The 2024 NCAA Men's Swim and Dive National Champion. That wraps up our edition of Cronkite Sports Live. For Max Zepeda, I'm Ben Paris saying so long. We'll see you again next week right here from Studio 6.